All right, we are live from Dallas, Texas. My name is Charlie Minato. Right here is... Patrick Legree. And right there is... I'm Brooks Whittington. That's good that you still remember your name today. I do. So we are here for the top 25 uh, cigars of 2019. This is... I guess we didn't do one the first year, Brooks, so... We did. We're working on... Like, this is the seventh one that Half Wheel's done? Mm. All right, so uh, I am not centered, but we'll take care of that in a second. So uh, hopefully we uh, are live and, and everything's going well. Um, if you didn't catch the messages on Instagram and elsewhere, um, what we are going to do is we're going to do this show. We're going to unveil the top 25 cigars uh, as efficiently as we can. Hopefully we're done in about an hour or so. We're going to start with 25, work our way down to one. We're going to take a little break, and then uh, about five or ten minutes later, we'll be back just on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live to answer any of your questions. If you have questions, put them in the comment section and Brian Burt uh, is going to get them and he will uh, send them over to us and we'll tackle them in the post show. Um, and so uh, I think with that said, um, we are going to start the top 25. So um, one thing that um, I've been talking about a lot, particularly with the consensus, is uh, I feel like there is not um, as much explanation about how we get to certain cigars and how lists are created. So um, we're going to explain to you the process of how Half Wheels list is created. The way it works is that uh, we look at the cigars that we review um, over the course of a, a certain um, year for the most part. Um, and uh, all the cigars are reviewed in 2019. There's has been years where like stuff that gets reviewed at the last minute and we can't access more cigars for the, the tasting of the top 25 um, get delayed. They need to score 91 points or above. That's been the standard uh, ever since we started doing this, I guess, in 2013. Uh, the cigars have to be released in 2018 or 19. It's got to be a regular review, which means that um, somebody has smoked three cigars, scored all of them, and then um, it gets a 91. Uh, and so... Uh, We've got some 91s, some 92s, some 93s. It's half wheel, so there's there's not really scores much higher than that uh, represented. Um, and then uh, what happens after that is so we have the three cigars that get purchased uh, or they get smoked for the review, and then we'll purchase three more cigars. We'll send them to the other reviewers. So uh, we have Patrick in Arizona, Brian Burtz in Florida, and Brooks and I are both here in Dallas. So uh, the other three people will all score them, and then it gets added into a spreadsheet like this. Now, this is last year's spreadsheet, and this is after everything was done. Uh, normally, the spreadsheet is uh, the, the yellow columns are usually all, or they're all blacked out until all the scores are put in. So that way, no one can see um, kind of what is trending to be the number one cigar of the year, et cetera. You can see uh, up there uh, that there are some very, very, there was a tie in, in between third or between fourth and fifth, and there was uh, number one and two was very close, as well as I believe 25 and 26 were extremely close last year. So we did the same exact process this year, um, and that's what led to the list. So without uh, any delay, we're going to go ahead and get started, and we will get started with number 25. So while a lot of companies have been adding AJ Fernandez to their bands, including Altidus USA, this year, they reached out to a, another name, another company, for the H. Upman Hispaniola by Jose Mendez Bellicoso. So this is the 175th anniversary year of the H. Upman brand. And Jose Mendez, if you're not familiar with him, is a tobacco grower. And Jose Pepe Mendez is credited with being one of the people that really developed premium cigar tobacco in the Dominican Republic. His name's appeared on a couple other lines, namely the Monte Cristo uh, line with Pilotico. Uh, well, sorry, the Monte Cristo used Pilotico in 2015 with the 80th anniversary, and then the Monte Cristo Pilotico Pepe Mendez, it was in 2016. So in terms of a blend, lots of Dominican tobacco. There's an Olo binder as well as Pilo, uh, Pilotico and Anduyo, which is kind of a funky uh, process where the tobacco is compressed into these rolls, or you can call them logs if you want, and creates a really interesting profile. Uh, then it gets an Ecuadorian Sumatra wrapper, and then there's some, uh, Nicaraguan tobacco in the filler as well. So as I mentioned in my review, this cigar checked a lot of boxes. It covers a lot of spots on the flavor wheel as far as I was concerned. Sweetness, creaminess, earth, pepper, woods, and it does it really nicely in terms of bringing them all together. And, you know, I, I think I can speak for all of us. I don't go into a cigar with expectations other than just I'm going to smoke it and see what I like about it. And I can tell you that this one certainly exceeded sort of my baseline for a, for a good premium cigar and really uh, was a fitting addition for the 175th anniversary of H. Upman. Yeah, no, I, um, the cigar was, was good. Um, obviously, to make this list, you gotta be a good cigar. One thing that's a little confusing, and I, I feel like you and I have both been to the Jose Mendez facility, um, 
uh, you've been there much more extensively than I have, but uh, we've both been there. It's an impressive facility, perhaps uh, the world's largest premium cigar tobacco processing facility, um, at least the largest one I've ever been to. But uh, for consumers, this has to be confusing as hell because they don't roll any cigars at Jose Mendes. These are rolled at the same factory where most Bonnie Cristos and Romeos are are rolled. And um, I really wish with this release they would have done, I guess, like a bit more to tell the story of, of Pepe Mendez. Uh, it just seemed like it was, like there was the release a couple of years ago with his face on it. That right. was the Monte Cristo. That one I think was a little bit much better like story well told. And the other question that I would have is like, most of the cigars that come out of Tobacco Laredo Garcia use a, a fair bit of tobacco from uh, the Jose Mendez facility and like what makes this one different like than, than those. Um, and those are the types of things that, you know, I guess you can nitpick at, but a good cigar nonetheless. Yeah, I, again, like I said, the one thing I can just remember smoking and going like this this exceeds sort of the not just the baseline expectations for any premium cigar but the marks that a better cigar uh are, is generally going to hit so that's number 25 the h upman hispaniola by jose mendez from altadas and now moving on to number 24 we travel to honduras and oscar valadar is in the wild hunter one of two new lines at the trade show this year from uh, Valadares. It's a Honduran Puro, available both in a natural and a Maduro. We smoked the natural, and I really loved it. And I'll be honest, like, you know, there's, you're going to see Honduran tobacco mentioned every so often, and a lot of times it seems like it doesn't get the, the recognition it deserves. But Oscar Valadares is quickly becoming one of the premium producers and, uh, of Honduran tobacco as well as Honduran Puro cigars. And when it's done right, it's fantastic and i think that's what he did with this cigar yeah when i uh, when i photographed this when i took the, uh, these out of the um out of the box to photograph them um i was uh, very surprised it was uh, smelled almost uh, infused to me very very distinct and strong smell um sweet floral fruit uh, i was very surprised at how it smelled and was wondering how it would uh taste in your review so i was glad to hear it yeah, and, and that's, again, we did packaging yesterday, but the packaging on this was also incredible with definitely the Wild Hunter mm -hmm. uh, camouflage. And it was, it was definitely like nominated, that. for sure. Absolutely. So, 24 is the Oscar Valadez Wild Hunter Natural, and now it takes us to number 23, which is the Illusion Epernay 10th Anniversary Diasta. Now, I'll be the first to admit I've grown a bit jaded by reviewing a different anniversary cigar seemingly every week, but this one was one that got me excited. Originally released in 2009 as a follow-up to ECCJ, uh, Epernay has become known as being a little bit milder of a line from Illusion, designed to be paired with champagne. And one of the things that I really liked about this going into it was the backstory, which is that Dion Giolito has family still in the Valle d'Aosta in northern Italy. Uh, and he said he visited them a few years ago and imagined Zeno Davidoff visiting the Italian side of the border, going skiing, having some nice meals, and growing and enjoying some of the wine that uh, his family grows, or the grapes that his family grows. And he said he wanted to make a cigar in the style that Zeno Davidoff liked and which made him so famous. And, you know, the profile is on the lighter side, but again, don't think this is another one of these not your father's Connecticut kind of cigars. Well, there's this, no Connecticut tobacco, right? Well, right, but I mean, that's the, you know, you start hearing lighter cigar, not designed, you know, to be a strength bomb, and people start to gravitate towards that idea. Uh, the, the, the words that I used was, it was a near symphonic journey that has, you know, creaminess, sweetness, there's some pepper in it, number of other flavors, all comes together really well, even though it's not necessarily trying to just be another Epernay. Yeah, no, I found it interesting um, that uh, the blend was, it, it certainly like hit the palate a lot different than the normal Epernay one, or normal Epernay blend does. Um, Epernay, I think, you know, is in sort of a pantheon of, of non-Cuban blends over the last decade, um, and, and perhaps even Cuban blends, to be quite honest. Uh, and so um, this was, uh, I certainly had high expectations. It's a very good cigar, um, but uh, I actually would prefer, and I'm curious to know kind of the two of your thoughts, I would prefer a regular Epernay, I think probably nine times out of 10 over this. I, <laughs> I don't know if I'd say Purple. that. Patrick. No, I... Uh, your thoughts? I don't know if I would necessarily agree with any Epernay. I think they're all really good. I mean, I smoked a Le Voyage uh, on New Year's Eve, the A-size and really, really enjoyed it, even though it is a little bit of a, 
it's a little bit, you know, it's a nine and a quarter inch cigar. Yeah, but it's a very, it's uh, someone that likes A's a lot. That's that A burns quicker than any other oh, A completely. that I do. And I look and I paired it with champagne. It was very enjoyable. But that's like an hour, like for me, that's perpetually slow. Like that's an hour and 45 minute smoke. Brooks, we've got to move on. But your thoughts on the regular upper A versus. I'll, I'll take any of them, buddy. I, I love them all. So um, completely non answer. Yeah. It's great. That's absolutely wonderful. Way to go. All, all right. right. So number 22 is the Liga Pravada. 10 anniversario, which I nailed. Thank you. Uh, now, this is a, a release, uh, obviously, for the uh, 10th anniversary of Liga Pravada, which we're not going to get into because it's <clears throat> the, uh, the date is in dispute. However, uh, the, uh, this is one of two cigars released for the, uh, for the anniversary of the uh, 10th anniversary for Liga Pravada, the other one being the H99. Um, both of them released in late 2018. Um, and... Uh, the cap on it is similar to the UF-13, um, it's, uh, which was released uh, years and years ago. Uh, and uh, it has the same filler and binder as the H99, um, but the uh, wrapper is different. And the Liga Pravada 10 Anniversario was actually, uh, it's actually a different, uh, they're, they're deciding to do this a little differently when they're talking about releasing it. What they do is they actually choose a number of retailers, uh, Drew Estate, Diplomat. The number happens to be five. Uh, okay, and the five retailers. Very minute amount of them. Uh, yeah, and they present, they ship uh, forty boxes um, between to, the five. between the five bo- between the five retailers, and uh, that's a, done by lottery uh, every month. And uh, so if you uh, if you win, you get the boxes. If you don't, you don't. Um, this was a very good cigar. What I found interesting about it was that um, I had smoked quite a bit of Liga Pravada uh, back in the day and, and years ago, and uh, I've kind of gotten away from it a little bit because I didn't feel like that. The profile had uh, was the same as, as what I remembered, um, and I smoke one about every three months or so just to check it. But this was more like the old Liga Pravadas that I remember um, from 2010, 2011, 2012, around that t- time period. Uh, it was really, really good, and um, I am I am absolutely uh, going to try to find another one or two. Yeah, singles. I'm smoking one right now. Um, it's it's a very good cigar. I'm a bit surprised that it finished as low as it did. I think there were some people that had some construction issues of all things. Um, but uh, it is a worthy follow-up to Liga Pravada. Last year, Liga Pravada made this list uh, with a, the number nine Corona Gorda, which is also a very good cigar. Um, I would say this, uh, you know, if we've learned anything about Liga Pravada over the 12 and a half years that it's been on the market now, um, it's that uh, you probably want to smoke them relatively fresh. Um, Age ligas are not, uh, it's not that they're bad, but they, the blend is made to be smoked fresh. And, and I think this one is certainly the case. I, you know, we have uh, a handful of them here left and, and these are kind of cigars that, you know, I, I intend on smoking or you, you're going to smoke sometime sure. in the next six or so months. Cause I, I don't think they're going to, you know, they're going to be okay and they're going to still be enjoyable, but they're, they're not going to be what they're supposed to be, um, a year from now. So with that said, we're going to move on to number 21. which is the Cohiba Connecticut Toro. So this is General Cigar Company's Cohiba, known as the Red Dot Cohiba. You can see the actual red dot in the O. Uh, This was released at the beginning of the year. It is very clearly an attempt to go after Davidoff White Label with the white bands. There's even like soft packs, very reminiscent of Davidoff. The pricing is obviously rather reminiscent of Davidoff. Um, And the blend itself is uh, somewhat Davidoff-like. Davidoff makes a lot of different cigars, but certainly um, if you are a core sort of white label anniversario smoker, um, you're gonna enjoy the Cohiba Connecticut Toro. It was, uh, my least favorite term in the world is New Age Connecticut. I don't think it was necessarily that. It was uh, a bit more amped up in the body, not so much in the strength. Um, And then obviously, you know, a big full flavor. Uh, I think it was in one of these Connecticut reviews. There's, There's quite a few of them that are on this list to be quite honest. But, um, you know, I think one thing that's always important to point out is people always recommend Connecticut cigars to new smokers because they're mild. Um, And I actually am not a huge fan of that because uh, I think that Connecticut cigars, a lot of times that wrapper has a lot of pepper in it. And and that's not something that you necessarily want to give to someone that's just starting out. I didn't think that was the case here, though. No, and I love the uh, I love the new bands, and uh, I love the uh, I don't love the price. That's a uh, that's a that's a pretty bad price for a uh, for a Connecticut, but it's uh, it is it is a very nice. very yeah, it's a very good cigar. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, very balanced, very creamy, um, and uh, like you said, just not that much um, pepper on the uh, on the retro hill. All right, 
So we're going to move on to number 20, hopefully, which is also a cigar that I reviewed this year. It is the Perdomo ESV Sun Grown uh, Torpedo, which I believe they call Prestigio. Uh, Prestigio? Prestigio? That's close enough. Spanish expert Brooks Whittington over here. Uh, so Indeed. this is uh, the latest iteration of the Perdomo ESV line. Um, it debuted at the trade show this year. Um, this is uh, notable because it's the first time that they have box pressed ESV. So it's available once again, as most Perdomos are in three different wrappers. You've got your Connecticut, the Sun Grown, and then there's a Maduro as well. The, the Sun Grown and the Maduro are both Nicaraguan Puros. Um, the Connecticut shade, I believe, comes from Ecuador. Um, and then uh, the fillers inside, um, for, Perdomo has used it. I'm going to be very honest. Patrick and I were both a bit confused when trying to nail down all the facts for this because uh, there's a lot of different versions of ESV. This is not the first time they've used Fink and Natalie tobacco, Natalie named for Nick Perdomo Jr.'s daughter. Uh, they did that a few years ago, but this is, I believe, the first time they're using the Lajero. It is definitively the first time they're using the box press, um, not the first time they're using this exact packaging. Um, and, uh, you know, Perdomo's not a company that releases a lot of new cigars and therefore doesn't make or isn't even eligible for this list. We don't review a ton of Perdomo's um, in the history of the site, but this was a very, very good cigar, one of the more dynamic por profiles I smoked all year. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. You know, and I still remember visiting the Fink and Natalie farm a few years ago and really seeing Nick beam with pride because you pull in and you're on this kind of cliff and you look down over it and he was just so incredibly proud and talking about when they were going to be able to start using the tobacco coming off this farm. And uh, this is a great example of what that, you know, of being able to see a project from early days, you know, through to production. And one of the things that I really do love about Perdomo is that they produce all if not the bulk of all of the lines with those same three wrappers you're talking about. And if you really want an interesting experience, go grab one of each in the three sizes, smoke them side by side. And you can really see the effects that the wrapper has and sort of how they all play together. The only thing, again, not that I feel like we need to knock anything, but Perdomo doesn't do anything smaller than a 54 in this. And look, Perdomo- 54 ring gauge for 54 this. ring gauge. Yeah. Uh, look, Perdomo knows their market. They know their efficiencies. You know, I'm not knocking on that. I would still love to try this in a little bit smaller ring gauge, but really, really nice cigar and, and, and great to see, personally, Perdomo make it on the list in, as you said, for a company that doesn't release a lot of new products. Yeah, I mean, it's for somebody like Perdomo or Ashton um, in particular, it's very tough to make it on half wheels list because uh, in Ashton's case, they, they just actually released a new blend, but, um, you know, Perdomo, those two companies traditionally, that nothing new, they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. One little factoid before we move on to number 19, uh, one of the most hilarious lines of all time. This is a limited edition cigar, and it's limited to, I believe, 984,000 total cigars, which is larger than multiple companies' productions who have cigars on this list. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's limited. They're right. only going to make a certain amount, uh, and it's also limited, uh, I believe, 144 stores, the top 30, 100, 133. Top 133 stores in the country have it, which is, once again, like, there's probably a company on here that, that doesn't have 133 accounts. Uh, so anyway. Almost guarantee you that one. So we move on to number 19, and that brings us to the Lil Pissed Off Kristoff. This is one of those cigars where you can get a pretty good idea of what's in store simply based on the name. It's Little, 5x44, and it is strong. Uh, the line was originally released back in the summer of 2016, billed as the fullest in the company's portfolio. And as the name... The legend of the name goes, a customer pitched the idea of the pissed off Kristoff to Glenn Case, who liked the sound of it, but not the spelling, so we adjusted it, and here you have the little pissed off Kristoff. Now, it was interesting because at the start of the year, they released an eight and a half by 60 Gordo Extra. It came out in January, and then a little bit later in the year, they released the little pissed off Kristoff, this five by 44. And this might very well be the strongest cigar on our list. Um, if not, it's definitely in the running, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. But the thing that really impressed me is that while definitely strong, it's balanced. And it just never, never showed roughness, never showed issue, and just really was an impressive cigar. Yeah, I was about to say exactly that. That the, the balance on this was, was astounding to me. The small size, the strength of it that uh, really was um, aggressive 
but uh, the balance was uh, was kept up with it. It was very, very good, and uh, some, certainly something that you could smoke on a nice uh, cold day, and uh, you know after a steak, and uh, it just it's just a really great size and a really great blend. I was gonna say probably a bit rough to start the day, but definitely no, I wouldn't start the, the, day the end of the day. So that's number nineteen, the little pissed off Kristoff. One little note here: uh, I didn't realize this until I was putting together the slideshow, but. Uh, one of the low, or one of the O's in this name is actually a uh, like angry smiley face, which is a nice little. Yeah. Uh, I assume in the pissed off part of it. That is correct. Yeah. And what's interesting that I noticed in my review is so in this one they put the little above. Yeah. And then they put the yeah, yeah. extreme on the bottom, which. Well, it's the same thing with the name. This is little pissed off Christoph, whereas all the rest of the sizes are uh, it's pissed off Christoph, whatever. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So same thing going on there, and that leads to number eighteen. All right, number 18 is the Crown Heads Court Reserve 18, which uh, Sublime or no, was, the, uh, was the one that we reviewed. Uh, the 18s are completely a coincidence, nothing more, I can assure you. Um, the, uh, this was a, uh, a blend that was released, and basically the name it takes uh, inspiration oh. from... Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Patrick's going to pump himself a drink. The uh, name takes uh, inspiration from the idea that... Um, uh, Huber has said that uh, his legion of followers, uh, the people who uh, love his cigars, uh, think of as a, uh, a court of people who, uh, you know, who are really part of this uh, community that love uh, their cigars and so uh, wanted to make a cigar basically um, that, uh, that has that inspiration in it and this was uh, what it was. Interesting um, that the fir this is the first release uh, from Crown Heads that uh, actually has Crown Heads in the name of the actual uh, cigar itself. Uh, all the other ones have had, you know, various names of, uh, uh, you know, things. Four kicks uh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so this is the first one that has that. I found it very, very complex. I loved it. I really loved it. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a great blend. Yeah, you know, it was, I was doing my kind of review, you know, looking over the site and getting over my notes together for this. And what's funny is this was a cigar that I think you and I smoked at the 2018 trade show. Yes. And I remember, you know, we talked about we never get a chance to smoke enough of a cigar. This is the one that I actually walked out of the show going, this, I want to go pick this up because it seemed really good. And it didn't come out until October of 18, which pushed it onto this year's list. Incidentally, it also placed eighth on last year's consensus. Yeah. And I think this is just one of those ones where we've talked about not necessarily gaming the system as far as getting your cigars to everyone at a certain time of the year to get on as many lists as possible. Um, but, but that's that's a bit too late. I mean, that's the same problem they're having this year, I think, with La Coalition, which is a cigar that I'm supposed to be reviewing shortly, but right. um, in a couple weeks, actually. But, you know, for us, we want to let the cigars come in here and rest for a month at a minimum. And the Absolutely. other problem that, that takes place with this list is that, you know, by September, the end of September, Brooks and I start having conversations about, okay, like, I can start working backwards from the rest of the year just based off the cigars that we have. And so um, there's a couple other cigars that are still from 2018 that are going to make this list. And, you know... Uh, thanks FTA slash thanks a whole bunch of new SKUs and, and I have a feeling that's how it's going to be going forward for pretty much everyone not just us here at Half Wheel Indeed. so uh, we're going to move on to number 17 and that is the Viaje Exclusivo Leaded Edición Limitada Corona Gorda or Corona Gorda uh, Edición Limitada uh, as I just butchered that so uh, this is uh, as Brian Burt breaks down on the site when the, the top 25 post actually goes up. Uh, so this is uh, Viaje Exclusivo, which is a blend that was originally made as uh, sort of described as Andre Farkas's personal blend that he released and has since made uh, dozens of Atolas of. The Nicaragua version refers to uh, a different subset blend, even though most Viajes are uh, at least internally Nicaraguan and, and almost all, or not almost all of them, but almost all of them are Nicar Nicaragua internals um, and a lot of them are, are Nicaraguan puros. Uh, Leaded refers to uh, Viajes sort of code word for using um, a uh, type of tobacco called Medio Tiempo. And so Medio Tiempo is, uh, it's part of the Lajero priming. So on a plant, you have what's called three different primings. And they're basically three different groups of leaves. And Lajero is at the top of the plant. They are the smallest of the leaves. Uh, there's, well, three that we use for tobacco um, or for cigars. Uh, and then um, they're the, the smallest of the leaves. Lajero actually means light. It doesn't mean uh, uh, strong. Um, it means light or thin in weight, actually. 
Um, and so uh, it is, uh, those leaves tend to be stronger. And what's happened, uh, thanks to Habano Sase, when they released the Cohiba Bihike, the original, or not the original, the BHK, they uh, decided to use what they called Medio Tiempo tobacco, which they claimed you can only find on certain plants and it grows above the Lajero priming. Um, and this cigar is made at Tabsa using Aganorsa tobacco, and Tabsa has been a big factory. You've seen this, uh, not just with Viaje, but also with Warped and others where they've used the Medio Tiempo branding. I sort of think it's kind of a marketing gimmick, but, you know, your thoughts? Yeah, I don't necessarily know if it's a gimmick. I think it's, you know, look, everyone's trying to find ways to carve out a little bit of space for themselves in the market. And certainly BHK was a, you know, a flagship, Halo, Top Notch, whatever It was a want, very good cigar. Whatever you want to call it. And it was fantastic. Um, I unfortunately haven't smoked many. You know what was better? Lately, because I, haven't, I don't want to get the original. alone. To buy you know what was better? The original. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. The original was. release is better. The original right. BHK, not the original Bihike, as you found out. Uh-huh. No, the original BHK was fantastic. No, I, I, I just think, like, you know, people have been using that tobacco for decades, if not centuries, and, and just calling it Lijero or right. calling it top of the plant, whatever. Um, and now you're starting to see people use it as a marketing technique. Um, I would be curious to know what would happen if you took the the leaded part of it or the Medi Tampa part out of it, to know how much Medi Tampa is in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. VI is not alone in sort of leaving those questions unanswered. Yeah. So now we're going to move on to number 16 which also involves me talking. And that is the Gran Habano Blue in Green, Gran Robusto, which is actually a Toro Extra, if we're gonna be quite clear about it. This is a Connecticut wrapped uh, cigar from Honduras. And uh, this was, uh, I think, one of the surprises of the year. There's a couple more surprises coming here, but you know, Gran Habano is not known. I would, I mean, they, they have had Connecticut cigars in the past, but uh, that's not what I think of when I think of Gran Habano. And um, this was something completely different. The packaging obviously is very reminiscent of Johnny Walker Blue Label, um, and the cigars are very good. I think when I reviewed this, I wrote in the review that this was the early candidate for most enjoyable cigar I've reviewed all year, just in terms of like. I'm going to go outside, pick a cigar at random, and just light it up and not have to worry about it. Construction was absolutely excellent on the cigar. It was very, very easy to smoke, which is not something I would say about a lot of the cigars in this list. A lot of them require a certain mental capacity to keep up with the flavor changes. This was not it. It just presented itself to you. You knew exactly what you were getting. Um, and I really was impressed with the balance of the cigar. It's something that I, I still remember even without having to go back and look through my notes. Uh, interesting little note, the pricing was supposed to be a little bit less than what it ended up being, or, or like a couple dollars less to be quite honest. I still think it's worth it for $9.50. Um, and uh, there's been a couple extensions, and I know that we have sort of ongoing discussion amongst the staff about which size is the best here. Um, yeah, and, and this is one where I distinctly remember the size playing a role. And, you know, it's one of the parts of the cigar industry that doesn't get talked about a lot, is that there's, there's sort of two schools of thought to blending. Uh, one is that you blend so that every size tastes the exact same. You know, and I use the example of a Coca-Cola. You know, it's going to taste the same more or less as you get it out of a can or a bottle or a fountain or whatever the case may be. Um, and then there's the other school of thought that says, blend, you know, let the size have an effect on what the blend does. And this is one that really did that because I've smoked the other sizes and enjoyable, but certainly not with the room to operate and the room to just kind of do its thing as the uh, Grand Robusto did. Again, you mentioned, you know, really complex range of flavors, maybe not the most pronounced, maybe not the most detailed, but I mean, certainly you know, nothing that you're going to be disappointed by. Yeah, except the naming, which is confusing as all hell. But uh, that's number 16, and we're going to uh, do a little recap. So uh, we're not going to read these off, but um, this is sort of how the scoreboard reads right now. These are the first 10 on the list. Um, and um, I would say, we'll just kind of quickly go down the line here. I would say, because uh, I think we have, each of us have one of these, and I think they're probably distinct. My surprise of the list here is I'm a bit surprised to see the Lee Gravata is low, I mean, still in the top 25, but uh, you know, not uh, in sort of the top 10, 15, which is where I personally would have had it. Patrick, I know you have one yeah, the, right around there. Yeah, I was thinking about the Illusion Epernay 10th anniversary. I mean, I, I smoked that, and we talked about this with Packaging Award yesterday. You know, you walk back to the bunker and you go, okay, get the list out, because I'm, I gotta add something. When I smoked this, I thought, okay, this is, like, there's a sign that was like, this is gonna keep my streak going, because, you I, might want to explain what your streak is, because so I don't think anyone understands the it. The last, I think I was the person who do the initial review on the last two number ones. Uh -huh. And I was saying, like, this has got to be it. And, you know, again, we all bring different preferences and, and whatnot to the, to the scores. But I definitely thought this was going to be 
pretty high up there. Burke yeah, if you can if you can taste it, you know, if you can if you can think that at the show where all the you know there's so much smoke and you you know smokes other cigars and something really you know jumps out at you in that regard. I mean, you know, it's probably going to be something that is uh, that's going to uh, taste pretty good when you actually review it. So uh, I agree with you 100 percent on that. What's uh, your big surprise amongst the top ten, positive or negative? Um, my big surprise is the uh, the hunter. Um, hunter. I was not. Ex- I well, was, you thought it was infused based on uh, the smell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was. I was not expecting it to be as good as it was, and it, it was. It was very, very good. It was a good cigar. All right, we're gonna move on uh, to the next set of cigars, um, and. And just as a really quick reminder, as we're doing that, uh, we well, have a. Well, let's go. Ahead. Let's go to fifteen. Yeah, we should. All right, we'll do the reminder after this. Uh, number fifteen is the My Father La Promesa Lancero. Now, speaking about the kind of impact that a Vitola can have on the cigars we were just a moment ago with uh, the Gran Habano, uh, this cigar really shone brightest, in my opinion, I think in the group's opinion, in this Lancero uh, format. The backstory is that uh, when Jose Pepin Garcia left Cuba, he made them a promise that he would succeed in his new life, and that promise is being fulfilled in this cigar. Uh, Ecuadorian Habano Oscuro wrapper, Nicaraguan binder filler, and I bring that up because if you had just given me the, that is my only description, and said, this is what this cigar uses for a blend, I wouldn't have imagined the bright citrus flavor that I got as a consistent um, in this particular size. I didn't get it in the other sizes. For whatever reason, it started off as tangerine and dried mango, orange, sort of that range of flavors was this overriding uh, note that went through just and again, I use music analogies a lot, like a, a, a fantastic violinist or flutist, you know, playing in front of a symphony. There's a lot going on behind it, but there is this one note that just really carries a cigar. Uh, construction was fantastic, and I think, Charlie, that's where I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, look, I, uh, I think I wrote my, this review, or I'm fairly certain, although I can't keep track of what day of the week it is at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, if you sort of gave me some tobacco, and I, I got, or I picked some tobacco, and I got to go to any factory, um, in the world to make Lanceros. I think the one that I would choose, or at least the one I would choose right off the top of my head would be my father. Um, as someone that has smoked uh, probably nearing 200 different Lanceros from all around the world, uh, Pepin has consistently made Lanceros. Uh, they're very, very good with uh, very, very good construction. Um, there was a little bit of a, a a period of time where that wasn't the case, uh, maybe four or five years ago, where there, you know, I was noticing amongst the My Father Number Four, which I think is probably the best regular production Lancero that you can go to a shop and, and just pick up, um, where that was, you know, having some rough spots, but they seem to figure it out. And um, I think this is much like you mentioned with the promo. I, th- I think this is a scenario where it would be fun to to smoke um, a My Father Number Four and a La Promesa Lancero, two different profiles, two very very similar bands, same factory, etc. But but two different profiles um, from the house of Papine. So uh, we're gonna move on to number 14 now. Hopefully. Am I doing this? Are you good? Oh yeah, no it is me. Okay, look at that. (laughs) Hey, hey. Uh, So number 14 is the HVC 500 years anniversary. You might be wondering, HVC is not even 10 years old. Why do they have a 500th anniversary? Uh, last year was the 500th anniversary of Havana, Cuba. HVC is named after Havana, literally Havana City. Um, and so uh, Rene Lorenzo, the, the company's founder, is from Havana, as many people in the cigar industry actually are. But he's uh, sort of of a new crop. He's much younger than most of the people that, that are in the industry that are from Havana. Uh, HVC broke out a few years ago with La Rosa, that which made our top 10. That cigar was fantastic. This cigar is is in that same ballpark. Maybe not as good as La Rosa, uh, but, uh, but still a very, very good cigar with some great packaging. Um, this is just another example of, uh, you know, it's crazy to think how many cigars come out uh, that are, you know, from Tabsa and, uh, and Raices that are Agonorsa, Agonorsa, Agonorsa. It's the same Criollo Corojo, and yet um, whether it's HVC, Illusione, Viaje, uh, Agonorsa, Leaf themselves, Warped, and a whole bunch of others. Now you got people like Gurkha in there as well. Um, and they're coming up with a ton of different blends and not what you would necessarily think of as a Nicaraguan Puro. Yeah, you know, I, when I read your review, you said something very early on that really stuck with me, which is every HVC cigar my new story. is I'll, a tribute to Cuba. You reviewed it. It was my news story. I said that every... No, oh, sorry, you're right. You're, yeah, that's right. In, in the news story. I'm sorry. You wrote that. Not that confused. Like, do you know that I didn't review <laughs> no, this no, cigar? No, no, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the terms I've come to sort of despise is Cuban-esque. 
And certainly when you see a cigar that has, I mean, everything is a tribute to Cuba. Like you said, yeah. the box has a Havana skyline. Um, it was his address. It was I mean, all these different aspects. And what I loved about this is I didn't really ever think about that when I smoked the cigar. Um, it's doing too much of its own thing to try and be something else. You know, there's a ton of, there's not, maybe not a ton, but some really big dynamic pepper in the blend. Um, creaminess, nuttiness, balance. Just, I mean, all the things, you know, again, keep checking the boxes. So, again, I'm hesitant to compare it to La Rosa or any of the other lines because then you're going off memory and whatnot. But I will tell you, like, I love the cigar. I love the box. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing Rainier, hopefully, at the, uh, in Nicaragua next week. All right, number 13 is the uh, Neanderthal LH. Uh, this is uh, Roma Craft, uh, the largest Neanderthal to date, I believe. Um, and uh, it was launched as a, uh, pre-launched, if you will, as a store, uh, at a specific store, which I forget. Tinderbox, maybe? Sorry? Tinderbox? No, no, it was uh, released uh, actually to the people who uh, are going to get this trophy. So this is actually a trophy uh, for Fine Ash, uh, Fine for Ash. Uh, the Quesada Reserve Prada that won a few years ago. Uh, so we had promised Sam that we would give him a trophy because that was a store exclusive, and Sam got the uh, first hundred boxes, if I'm not mistaken, of the Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a very, very strong cigar, but one of the things I loved about it, uh, Neanderthal is a very strong blend in general, but one of the things I loved about it was the fact that the flavors and the complexity really kept up with the strength. It's really a dense uh, profile, and it's strong, it's aggressive, it's, but the flavors just uh, never let up and really, really kept up with it. Yeah, no, I, uh, I reviewed this cigar, uh, Neanderthal, you know, Neanderthal actually made the top three, uh, the OM Lancero, which uh, was a Stogie's exclusive and is now somewhere else as well. You just oh, read yeah, about it. Yeah. Fine Ash. Yeah, also Fine Ash. Fine Ash. Uh, Fine Ash. Uh, yeah. Actually on sale now, and then it'll a limited bit, and then. And if you use the coupon bit. code Patrick, you can get 10% off at checkout. Shout um, out to Arizona and Glendale. But uh, yeah, so um, the OM made the top three, uh, despite the fact I think all of us would say that Neanderthal is not the most complex of blends, certainly not the most complex blend that Romacraft makes. But the box press here helps so much. Um, you know, to Patrick's point earlier about how the Vitola can make a cigar. To me, the the, L, the OM, the Lancero, is is a more complex cigar than this. But this is my favorite one to smoke. This is the one if you put all nine of them on a the table and ask me, you know, which one would you take? It, it's no question. And it's just because of how much easier it is to enjoy it and maybe also to cut it and other sorts of things. Uh, but the construction was great, and, and I agree with everything you said, which is a pretty rare occasion. So congrats, yes. uh, and then, and congrats wanna, Skip and Mike. I want to point out really quick, the construction on this was astounding. Uh, yeah. My sample was, I, I never had to touch it after the first you know, the first light. What did it you just, like, just put your mouth next to the ashtray? Uh, <laughs> How'd you get um, the smoke? It, like osmosis? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just, it was, it was excellent and yeah, uh, I mean, something that I thought needed to be mentioned. And, and I'll just, real quick, Nico Sueno <laughs> is really on point right now in terms of their construction. And the thing that always gets me is they always feel like really firm, incredibly well-packed cigars. And I do that little squeeze and I go, God, how in the world is they ever going to get through this thing? And it's like they figured it out. It is top notch. No, I mean, Nico Sueno, I think, has been the, on the honorable mention list for factories, I mean, essentially, I think, as long as I can remember at this point, And it's very well deserved. Um, you know, the cigars that we review, unfortunately, from them tend to be kind of weird things. A lot of it's craft and stuff that doesn't necessarily score as well, or at least hasn't scored as well to date. Um, but then you end up with things like this uh, that are absolutely fantastic. And I, I can't wait to see um, what they do for their 10th anniversary this year. So we're going to move on to number 12. And that is the La Aurora 115th anniversary limited edition uh, I believe this is the Toro, Grand Toro. So uh, this is a 6x58, almost a 6x60. Uh, it's one of two different 115th anniversary blends. So there is the limited edition, which comes uh, in jars, and or jars or special boxes. And then there's a different one that's got a different band on it. That's the regular production version. Uh, this one is the more expensive version. Um, and it was very good. You know, La Aurora is, is an interesting sort of case. Uh, I think over the last few years, they've really tried to focus on making value price cigars. And they've done a good job with things like the, the Time Capsule series. But this was the complete opposite direction of that. Um, it also gets a nice little shout out for being like not released in the anniversary year. It was announced in 2018, 
It came out in 2019, and it's making our list in technically in 2020. Um, but uh, a very good cigar nonetheless. Um, and, and, you know, one of the pleasant surprises, Lower Wars made a lot of very good cigars over the years, um, but we just haven't seen in them as much when it comes to their new stuff, uh, I would say, in the last three or four years. Yeah, you know, when I think back to the days when I really got into cigar smoking with regularity and with purpose, and it was when La Aurora had the Cien Anos and the 107, mm. and it was like they were front and center every humidor I was in. Twitter was just lighting up whenever something would come out. They had, Twitter, they had Twitter back then? It, All 78 it, yeah, people. It was, yeah, I mean, you can only text like 20 characters at a time, but it was, it was the good old glory days of Twitter. Um, and so for me, it's really nice to see La Aurora return to prominence in humidors. Um, and I, again, I don't know if it's just an anniversary cigar thing is, is going to be what does it, but you know, I, I think like you, I wish the release had been a little bit cleaner. Um, it was confusing as hell. Yeah. I mean, there was the limited versus the regular blend info was varied. I mean, there was they actually the, the blend info. They, they told multiple people different things. That, right. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I thought was sort of the, the downside going into it is it didn't seem like a really clean release. And in terms you know, of, I think at one point. We had one set of information. Cigar Fusano had another set of information. And there was another set of information on Lara Wars website. And I don't think right. any of the three of them were 100% correct. Yeah. That all said. Sticker. They get a trophy for that. They do. Um, but the cigar is incredibly good. And I, again, for me, it's nice to see La Aurora come back into places of prominence. You know, there are certain brands, not that we cheer for anybody, but it's nice to see brands in good spots in the human world. No, absolutely. And it seems like this is selling well. I, I've seen on a couple of online retailers where they, you know, it's in stock and then it's sold out. And so uh, kudos to La Aurora and Miami Cigar Company, their U.S. distributor. And uh, that we're going to get to number 11 and then we'll take a little break. And so that cigar, oops, sorry. There was a number 11 graphic that showed up, but you didn't see it. Uh, but you'll see this one. It is the Aurora Amastron 1118, uh, which might as well be known as Camacho Diploma 3.0 or whatever number we're on at this point. Uh, so this is from Krishna Rose CLE. Uh, this is a Honduran Puro. Uh, Hamastron refers to the Hamastron Valley, which is the area where they grow a lot of tobacco that on the Honduran-Nicaraguan border. Um, and it is made at the El Aladino factory in Don Lee. It is in the 1118 Perfecto size, which is a, a size that Christian and his father made famous when they owned Camacho. Um, and uh, this cigar looks like a diploma. It comes in the triangular boxes that the Camacho diplomas uh, were known for. And, and actually, uh, the Davidoff version of Camacho is brought back. Um, and it was uh, absolutely fantastic. We have a, a buddy of ours, uh, Brooks and I, who lives here in Dallas, who loves um, like medium full Corojo, like flavorful Corojo. And I remember when I was smoking the cigar, I smoked the second sample and I texted him, I was like, hey, uh, like, uh, just so you know, like, I don't know if you're still smoking cigars with a ton of regularity, but like the next time you're in a shop, look for this. This has your name written all over it. And quite honestly, it, it had my name and I think your name as well, Brooks, written all over it. I was astounded by this cigar. I, I smoked it uh, and, and just, I was like, wow, I've got to get some of these. These are, <coughs> this is really good, really amazing. Um, I, I'm not, you know, CLE obviously can, can make good cigars, but I just, I, I had no preconception going into it. And uh, usually Honduran tobacco is not something that I, I gravitate towards. And uh, it's, it blew me away. It is definitely, I, I think it should have gone a lot higher, which I guess we can mention in just a minute. But uh, uh, I was, I was, I just love it. Love it. Yeah. And again, I, I've said it before, I'll keep saying it. Not every Honduran tobacco leaf is fantastic. <laughs> no, when it's done right, <laughs> which the Iroas do, it can be uh, truly fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, no, great cigar. Um, and one little note, this is an exclusive, uh, or this size was an exclusive for the TAA, the Packness Association of America retailers. There was a robusta size that was sold nationally. Uh, much to your point earlier, size makes the blend. This is the better of the two, in my opinion. Um, I'm surprised it doesn't take that long to get through, which is really... No, not at all. I, yeah, I went back and tried the uh, Robusto after trying the, the, the 1118, and it sings in the 1118. There's yep. no doubt about it. Literally sings to Brooks. Sings <laughs> to me. It doesn't have to touch it. All a right. little lullaby. So little... here's the recap of uh, the first 15, as we're calling it. So you can see numbers 11 through 25. Patrick wants to do a little quick plug, and then we will move on. Yeah, so as you're taking a look at this, if you have questions, comments, just want to throw something uh, out for us to discuss, do that in the Facebook comment section or the chat section. Uh, we got Brian Burt, who is skipping work at the moment to keep an eye on those for us. He's going to relay them to us. So once we get through the top 25, we are going to take a quick break, five minutes or so, 
and then we are going to start a new stream uh, just on, on Facebook. Just on Facebook, and it's going to be the Q and A, the comments, the discussions, the pouring of more rum, the smoking of more cigars. So probably have, watch us order lunch live. That's very true. Uh, so if you do have a question or comment you want us to address, throw it in the current Facebook chat room uh, comment section, and we'll get to that in the post show. All right. Thank you, Brian Burt. Thank you, Brian. Number 10 is the Crux Epicure Short Salomon. Uh, now, this is a little bit of a uh, convoluted uh, uh, story about the, uh, the Crux uh, Epicure blend. Uh, announced in 2016, was supposed to be a release in 2016. Um, it actually made its first appearance in early 2017 at the uh, uh, Smoke Oklahoma, I believe. Uh, yeah, ZT sampler. Cigars. Mm -hmm. And a sampler uh, for Smoke Oklahoma. Uh, but actually, the other three sizes, along with the Corona Gorda, um, became regular production and they were released later in 2017. This is a brand new size in 2018. Um, that was announced along with two other blends in the same size, the uh, Limitada and the Guild, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is the only one that has shipped, I believe, so far. Um, but, I, you know, this, this was something that um, I, I had tried the Corona Gorda uh, and was, I liked it. It's a, you know, it's a nice uh, little Connecticut, but um, this is much, much better in, in, in terms of the blend itself. It's just, it really, really is great. Creamy, sweet. Um, you know, a little bit of pepper on the retro hail and uh, nutty, just really a great, um, a really great Connecticut. And I think that uh, it's a great size and, and something that people will enjoy. Yeah, you know, we don't see all the specific blend details that go into cigars. And so somebody says, well, it's an Ecuadorian Connecticut, Nicaraguan binder filler. And you go, okay, like, I sort of have an idea of what that's going to taste like. And then you end up smoking it. And for me, again, lots of sweetness without being obnoxious um, but really nice balance on the scale with the heavier notes that the, that the Nicaraguan tobacco contributes not a lot of strength which is always fine with me because I smoked a cigar not that long ago that had me like wobbling and grand, you know holding onto the wall for a few minutes not to say that it's just a mild cigar but it's, no, it's no, a no. very it's it's just I mean it's it's got enough strength to keep things interesting it's just not uh, it's not the main point at any point during the, the profile at all I, right. I, I believe Right, and again, this is one of those cigars that, again, first half of the year release, only 5,000 if I'm not mistaken, and at least the stores that, in my area seem to sell through them pretty quickly. So, again, I was thinking about this and going, man, I haven't seen this cigar in a while. And then you go back and you go, well, it came out in the spring and there's only 5,000 of them, and it's a good cigar. Yeah, it was their first Connecticut blend, Crux's first Connecticut blend, and I'm interested to see if they, uh, if they come out with something else uh, based on that. Indeed. So that's uh, number 10, the Crux Epicure Short Solomon. We now move to number nine. All right, Dunbarton and Saka fans, you can finally exhale as the number nine goes to the Sin Compromiso Numero Seis, an exclusive size that Steve made for Corona Cigar Company. Now, line came out in 2018, five regular sizes, but a sixth was added just before the end of 2018 for Corona Cigar Company in Orlando. It's a six by 60, kept the same blend, meaning Mexican San Andreas Negro, Cultivo Tonto wrapper, and shout out to Steve for always being detailed with his blend shout information. Out. Ecuadorian Havana binder, Nicaraguan filler. Now the name means without compromise, and Steve prides himself on that for this line and truly all of his lines. Uh, when I smoked, the, or when I had the chance to smoke this Scordo, medium full, full body profile, lots of chocolate, and then kind of cascading down to another other familiar flavors uh, that we'd find in cigars. Yeah, and the interesting thing for me is that six by sixty has never been a favorite size of mine. Uh, Vitola, I've, I've, I shy away from them in terms of my own personal uh, enjoyment. Typically, uh, this is really, really great in this size. It's really nice, uh, and uh, I actually enjoyed it quite a bit more than the uh, Unicorn, which uh, is a hundred dollar cigar. And um, that was a very weird comparison. <laughs> Most interesting fact about this is, uh, anyone want to guess where the Sin Compromiso ended up last year? It was number nine. It was number nine. There you go. Yeah. So back-to-back -back number nines there for you the Sin Compromiso blend. And that Unfortunately, I don't think he's going to ever come out with something called Sin Compromiso number nine for reasons that I won't get into. But uh, Very good point. Probably not. Takes us to number eight and probably one of the more surprising cigars that we smoked this year. 
comes from Dapper Cigar Company and Ian Reith, a small operation out of Fresno, California. This is the Kubo Sumatra Robusto. Now, this cigar began shipping in the final week of 2018. It's made at the Noxa factory in Esteli. And Ian, like Steve Sock, is actually pretty detailed about uh, the tobacco that goes into this. Ecuadorian Sumatra wrapper grown by the Oliva Tobacco Company. Binder comes from Oliva uh, in the jalapeno. Uh, jalapeno? Jalapeno. Jalapeno. Yes. Boy, that was a, talking about pulling the brooks there. <laughs> was uh, in Jalapa. <laughs> also known as a Woo. fuck up. Well, that's true too. And uh, the fillers come from Oliva. You nailed it. As well as an undisclosed grower in Nicaragua and some Connecticut broadleaf from Lancaster Leaf. Uh, it's a really interesting blend. You know, Sumatra, I've been harping on, Nic on Honduran. Sumatra isn't a leaf I feel like we see a lot of these days. I mean, it's out there. But it's certainly not, you know, the hot and sexy leaf of 2019, 2020. Well, I, I th actually, for a little bit more inside baseball on that, um, the reason why we're not seeing a ton of Sumatra stuff right now is because the machine-made people are buying up Sumatra wrapper, um, and they're willing to, uh, as well as Connecticut shade for that matter, but they're willing to buy it. Uh, they don't really care uh, about the the quality as much um so they're willing to buy all the crop versus the premium guys who only want the, the sort of high-end stuff and they're also willing to uh deal with uh having less sorting and if you're a wrapper grower the most in labor intensive part of your uh, operation is sorting the wrapper uh, by color and shade and grade and, and the, the machine made guys will just buy all of it They'll just buy it in bulk there you go so like i said so much like we don't see a lot of so much these days again when you do find it and it's done right it really is a flavorful leaf. The one thing I noticed, that I remember from some conversations, is this Mexican hot chocolate note of cocoa, chocolate, cinnamon, creaminess. Uh, again, like we talked about with a little pissed off Kristoff, probably not a first cigar of the day kind of thing if you're smoking it you know, over the morning newspaper or if anybody you know, is doing this whole online news thing, I don't know. Uh, but again, a little bit later. Shout out to day. our four readers. There you go. Uh, again, a little later in the day, and once the blend really starts harmonizing all the pieces together, very enjoyable. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It's surprising, I, I hadn't, you know, I've heard of Dapper, but uh, I didn't know nothing about this, uh, this line. And um, it was very uh, surprising when I was, I was, I was very, very impressed with it. Mexican hot chocolate, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the, sorry, what number are we on? Seven. Oh, sorry, I skipped over it. Let's go back. <laughs> there we go. There it is. Oh, no. Is that, is that you? That, yeah, well, you sort of false starts oh. there. So, uh, yeah. No, Talk number seven. Wife, she says that all the time. Uh, is, uh, didn't need to do that. Uh, is uh, the row of the first 20 years Diadema. This is the second uh, CLE cigar on the list and the second one that happens to be in a non Parejo shape. Uh, this is the longest cigar on the list at eight inches long. And uh, it is also another cigar that was released as an exclusive to the TAA. Came out in mid-2018, but uh, for whatever reason, we didn't get around to smoking it until 2019. And uh, I'm glad we did. It is a fantastic cigar. I actually smoked another one a couple days ago. And um, I was as impressed as I was when I smoked it the first time. I didn't review it. Um, but uh, it, was, it was everything that, you know you want in that, that blend, which um, is a very good blend and, and has certainly been recognized by a number of people. And uh, um, I actually prefer the Amastron, the one that finished 11th, more than this one, which is super confusing. And needless to say, we've screwed up the ordering a couple times here. Uh, but uh, this one scored higher with us. Um, and I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the big difference here was the construction on this was flawless, I think, across the board, whereas I think the Amastron had maybe a, a couple little hiccups here and there. And with something like uh, the top 25, and you start talking about the top 15, a hiccup here and there is, is the difference between five places or four places. Um, and so another uh, fantastic cigar from CLE, who is certainly sort of one of the surprise companies of uh, the year and, and of our list. Yeah, and again, Honduran tobacco, Honduran tobacco, Honduran tobacco, done right, very good. What's notable about this one is that the wrapper is a Mexican seed, but Honduran grown. And I think we've had some little backs and forths about where we taste, like there's points where you actually think like you're tasting a Mexican San Andreas flavor from the cigar, but then you realize it's, this is still all Honduran. Um, that was one of the things that, that stuck with me. And again, too, with this one, not a very long smoking time, a little over two hours, which for a cigar of that size is, is refreshingly impressive, maybe, that you don't have to buckle it in for four hours to get through it. No, and the other part was it was despite the size, which is a little awkward when you first get started, it was just super easy to smoke. Um, and uh, I think that made 
when I was smoking the other day, I was a bit surprised how quickly I was going through it. And it, and it was because it was, you know, you go a little bit quicker and the cigar doesn't punish you for it. And, um, you know, certainly uh, two cigars in the top 11 for Sealy is an impressive year. Um, and uh, I would gladly smoke both of them again just about any day of the week. So that brings us to number six, which is, I believe, Brooks's. Number six. This is the... Uh, <clears throat> This is the uh, TAA 51th. There we go. 51th. Doesn't, uh, doesn't make much sense, but the, uh, that's makes what's on the... Makes a lot of the, sense, actually, <laughs> but <laughs> keep going. That's what's on the, uh, that's what's on the band. Um, it's supposed to be 51st. The uh, factory apparently screwed up the band. Um, but uh, that is what it says on the band. It is a uh, exclusive. It was an exclusive for the TAA, uh, which you're going to hear a lot uh, or have heard a lot today. Um, but it, uh, it's made, uh, it's a fifth cigar TAA release that's been on our list from uh, uh, Tatuaje over the years. Um, it is uh, also the first one that's actually uh, incorporated a Mexican San Andreas wrapper. Um, the vast majority of his uh, TAA releases, uh, Pete's TAA releases, have uh, been made up of a, a Connecticut broadleaf wrapper. Um, I found it to be uh, just excellent. Uh, it's wonderful. It was uh, not as uh, not as much pepper as the uh, Connecticut Broadleaf uh, cigars that uh, that he normally releases. Uh, a little bit more sweetness to me, uh, and uh, really, really just a, a great profile along with uh, some really nice balance. Yeah, no, it was uh, the the TA cigars. I think have quietly become the original TA were based on uh, what we were told is they were based on sort of two legendary single store releases from Taiwan, the Barkley Rex and the Pork Tenderloin, um, and the the TA the first TA was extremely good. Um, the 2014, I believe, was one our cigar of the year, um, and uh, it's consistently with maybe that one little Ecuadorian Habano wrapper uh, has been, you know, absolutely fantastic. And uh, this was no different, despite the wrapper change. Um, and another, you know, another top 10 performance of the Taiwan TAA, which is uh, sets the bar. There is a 2021 coming with it looks like slightly different packaging. We'll hopefully know more details hopefully soon. The, hopefully the band isn't screwed up. Or not. I mean, I liked the whole Mexican approach to it. If you yeah. uh, look closely at the band, you'll see that there is a uh, cactus. Oh, it's going to do the full thing here. Mm -hmm. But you'll see that the uh, the there's a cactus with a sombrero, and then it's got the, the TA logo that would normally be an Indian, and then the uh, a cigar store Indian, and then there's uh, where it would say America has been crossed out with Mexico, and then you know the 51th, which 51th. was a lot of fun to write out and even more fun to say. Yeah, I don't know how many times I had to stop and look at that mm -hmm. cigar two, three times just to go, like, what in the world is going on here? Yeah, well, I mean, Nicaragua. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes us through the first 20. Not to be confused with the Aroa. Right, which is, yeah. Uh, but first 20 cigars, mm -hmm. as you can see, I mean, really a mix of countries, of blends, of profiles, of sizes, of all sorts of different things. Uh, I don't know if we need to spend too much time kind of analyzing this no yeah. i think we should just get to the top five yeah and again just remember facebook comments we're gonna do a secondary a second show after this uh where we talk about your questions comments brian burt is uh monitoring those and going to be sending them to us in between the show so about a five minute break after we get done with this and uh, can't wait to see what you guys are asking and chatting about in the, in the comments all right so number five which is the High Clear Castle Victorian Toro, now often referred to as the High Clear Castle Maduro. Nick Melillo changed a few things for this blend, notably going to a higher priming Ecuadorian Habano leaf than what's on the original, both for color and flavor changes. Nicaraguan filler has some modifications. And in fact, the only thing that is the same as the original one is the Brazilian Montefina binder. What I loved about this is that it took the best flavors of the original and just turned them up without losing balance. You know, this, to use musical terms, this isn't a remix, but it's sort of a re-engineering with some slightly different instruments to give the profile a different flavor and different feel. The only thing that I can, looking back at my notes, remember about the cigar that I had a problem with is it, it sort of lacks some sweetness, but certainly not at the expense of being a really, really good cigar. And again, what amazed me is that he were able to take a little bit higher priming of the wrapper, modify a few things, and just bring out the best parts of those components and let them shine without making the cigar too intense, too noisy, trying to do too much. It was just a really well blended, and I would, again, 
kind of a well-engineered cigar to get the most out of the leaves that were being in it. I found it had plenty of sweetness uh, to my palate. However, the important thing to me was I actually reviewed the original, uh, and I found this to be far superior in right. just about every way. Um, it's not even close, in my opinion. So, No, I, I'd agree. I was not the biggest fan of the original Haiku Castle, but the Victorian, like I said, just it was able to take what I liked about the original and just turn it up without getting messy. To 11 or... Yeah, not quite to 11, okay. but to a, you know... Just wondering how... To a, a sign where you're getting a lot of, you know, you're getting a good full signal without clipping. <laughs> That's an audio term for those of you that are absolutely baffled by it. Right. And we're going to move on to number four. Oh, yeah, no, I have to do this because, yeah, because Brooks can't pronounce it. So uh, number four is the Mikrita. Actually, he can. Tricky Traka. And this is the larger of the two sizes. This is the number 648, and it is 6x48. So this blend was originally released uh, for uh, Two Guys Smoke Shop as part of their Firecracker series, which comes out shortly before July 4th every year. Uh, at the time, Saka said that he had sort of amped up the regular Mikarita blend a bit, and, um, and then it was so well-loved that he decided uh, to come back with it. I'm sure he probably complained that he was going to have to make more of them, too, because it's Steve. Um, and uh, it is a very, very good cigar. Uh, it's the second cigar from Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust on this list, which joins CLE um, on the multiple cigars on the list so far. And, uh, yeah, there is another size supposed to be coming, a little bit shorter size coming out this year. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, I like um, the Mikarita in the short Churchill size a lot, um, but uh, otherwise, uh, compared to the rest of the regular Mikaritas, uh, I also like the Firecracker quite a bit too, but compared to the rest, um, I would take the Tricky Traka, and I believe the Firecracker made the list last year, if I'm not mistaken. Does anyone? Yes. Sounds right? Brooks says it's right. Sounds right. right. So, who knows? <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, a very, very good cigar, um, and, uh, you know, uh, the second cigar from Noxa on the list joining the, uh, the Kubo Sumatra. Yeah, one of the things that I've come to be guarded against when hearing about blends. Not shots. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the amped up. Good luck getting through this. Woo! Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. That, that, uh, how many moving on now. About four now? I haven't had anything to eat all day. Well, that always helps. Um, but, you know, you hear the name Firecracker and, and Tricky Truck, and yeah, and it's fun to say. And then you're going, well, this is supposed to be an amped up me Korea. Or, what, you know, and, and again, Steve says something, and then it gets you know, passed on and it becomes the strongest, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And what was funny is that Steve actually said, this is not a big pepper bomb. This is about denser, heavier, chewier smoke. And you would notice it, again, you're, you're going to have your own reaction to it, but that's what he was sort of pointing in the direction of. And I distinctly remember getting that sensation in the second third of the cigar. And then it finishes with a little more of the harrow in the third doesn't quite gut punch you to the floor, but definitely gives you some good kick. And what, rem what going over this reminded me of, I wanted to smoke this and the original Mikarita side by side. Haven't done it because, yes, I have tons of free time, but something that I definitely want to do before long. Yeah, I, uh, I'm always been amazed at Steve's descriptions because a lot of times, um, while they're um, extremely um, verbose, typically, uh, they really are nailing they nail what 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 you what you get from his cigars a lot of times at least for me and um so you're i mean you're right i i just i, I love this blend so, are you suggesting so, so that you much. read steve's comments but don't read our site um no i don't read the site at i don't all. think he's I, suggesting I, it. I, just, I think he's out okay. stating it well you know first time for everything we have a website <laughs> all right and that takes us to number three which is the placencia alma del fuego if you, if Charlie can advance the slide one more time. Thank you, sir. The Placencia Alma del Fuego in the Candente size, which is a 5x50 Robusto. Uh, now, this is the third release in the Alma series, and four at Placencia went to the island of Ometepe, devoting about 75% of the overall blend to the cigar. The wrapper comes from the Jalapa region of Nicaragua. And Ometepe is probably the least known and least used in terms of quantity when it comes to Nicaraguan tobacco. Um, it's a small, it's an island in the middle of Lake Nicaragua. They grow well, there's that one farm that Davidoff owns on the Pan American Highway, like in the middle of nowhere. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't think Ometepe shows up as much as... No, no, absolutely not. Certainly the other regions of Nicaragua. Um, 
it's not always necessarily the most agreeable tobacco because it can be very earthy, very rich, very hard. Yeah, Brooks hates it. Peppery. Very aggressive um, on the palate to me. And again, when it's done right, though, I think it works really, really well. And that's what it does here. Earthy, rich cigar. I also got some really nice aloe sweetness out of it that I thought was really enjoyable. And I think a lot of times sweetness gets overlooked in strong cigars, but they usually go hand in hand. Uh, but plenty of pepper, meaty, uh, and also a really nice progression through the flavors. Uh, that was one of the things I noted from uh, when I smoked. And in fact, I was in a store just the other day and grabbed this as well as the other two. And I still maintain this is the best of the three Alma releases so far. Uh, and again, nothing against Alma Fuerte, Alma del Campo, both very, very good cigars. But for me, this one just stood a little bit taller than the other two. I was shocked at how much I like this because of that Ometepe. Um, I just, I can typically, I cannot stand that tobacco and anything that has anything with it. It's so aggressive on my palate for some reason. But for whatever reason, they did it right. And it just, it's, it, it really, um, it really, everything comes together for this cigar. It's really, really a great cigar, no doubt. Little note from the uh, IPCPR show, oh, sorry, PCA show was, was, the, IPCPR? was IPCPR at the time. Yeah. Then um, was the idea that uh, they, they had this, uh, 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 Placencia had a package uh, box that was on a, pedestal that had fake flames coming out of it, of the bottom of it. Uh, and uh, it looked so real that uh, apparently they had to have the fire marshal come and look at it and make sure it wasn't real flames coming up and, you know, toasting things before they, uh, before they allowed it to go, go forward. So uh, just a little note that doesn't mean anything about the No, it was cigar. super impressive. Daniel Marshall had a campfire, too. And uh, it was certainly well talked about the show. That's one of the, I mean, it was... In, I think that whole series has been talked about quite a bit. I think as it progresses, I think that it's really starting to put Placentia more on the map in terms of, oh, you know, having their own lens and having their own identity as opposed to just a, you know, factory where... Factory for higher Thousands, kind of thing, right, yeah. thousands of uh, blends are made. Right. No, absolutely. This was... I have really, really been impressed by the Alma series and, and seeing Placentia get their name... Uh, at the forefront as opposed to the blank made at Placencia. No, and they've tried it before. I think the, I one, that. the one advantage that Placencia's got is that, um, you know, they, uh, they don't need these cigars to sell. Uh, they have, uh, they're one of the largest farmers, one of the largest producers in both Nicaragua and Honduras. And so it's a little bit easier when, um, you know, you're not living paycheck to paycheck, hoping that this retailer buys four boxes. And Placencia has been able to do it right this time. They, it's also helpful that they've had a sort of second approach to it. They, they've had other cigars sold through General in the past with their name on it, but they, you know, they sort of took it a, a much different approach to it. They've certainly hired some very creative people to do the packaging. You know, this is a, all the series has come with uh, boxes that double as ashtrays. The sizes for the first one were super interesting, not sizes that if you were having to, you know, make sure that you sell all 5,000 cigars you roll this week, and Placencia rolls a lot more than 5,000 cigars in a day, but, um, you know, they have some advantages when you're that big and you can take it slow. And I also appreciate the fact that they haven't, you know, gone out and hired 20 reps and they haven't decided to try to put, you know, millions of cigars on the market in a very short period of time. They're doing it um, in a manner where, you know, they're, they're being aggressive, but they're also sort of taking their time and they're, they're now letting the, the sort of blends and the lines prosper. And, and it's certainly, you know, you walk into a cigar shop today and, and most of them have Placencia. Um, and most of them seem to be selling Placencia very, very well. Uh, sort of a, a similar trajectory to Oscar uh, in, the, in the Leaf by Oscar, I guess, more so, but uh, much different, you know, Oscar's got a factory, Placencia's got factories. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a fitting honor uh, at number three, a, an excellent cigar, and that's going to get us down to the top two. Last year, I suggested that, uh, or I indicated that, you know, it was the closest we'd ever been. It was separated by eight hundredths of a point, and uh, this year uh, it was separated by uh, 0 0.015 between this cigar and the cigar that will ultimately take the top honors. But for, at number two, it is the most expensive cigar on the list, the Cohiba Spectre CS19. This is the sophomore release for the Cohiba Spectre series. Cohiba is General Cigar Company's flagship brand. Spectre is sort of, uh, I've sort of described it as the, you know, no expense spared, although it's also $90, just like the first one was. It won, uh, won and tied for the, the top packaging award yesterday from on our list. The packaging is absolutely fantastic and the cigar is equally fantastic um, this is a cigar that is uh, the boxes are super impressive the tubos are 
one of the more impressive tubas we've ever seen, to be quite frank. Um, cigars rolled by a single pair. It's very limited production. There was about 280 boxes of 10 released this year. Um, and it uses, uh, if you've ever been to the General Cigar Factory, one of the things they love to show off on the tour is they have uh, barrels of sh or sherry, spent sherry barrels that they age tobacco in. And um, this uses some of that tobacco as well as a wrapper that's aged in other barrels. And uh, one interesting note about this one, um, I was the one that reviewed it. The first two cigars I smoked, it was a very, very good cigar, um, but nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. The third cigar I smoked, cut the cap and put it into my mouth to take a cold draw, and I realized that it was sweet-tipped. Um, and I did a little bit more investigation because it wasn't the normal sweet tip sensation. And what I realized was that uh, only about a third of the cap had what I could tell was sugar on it, and the rest of it seemed like it was normal, um, which is, you know, was kind of like, was that a mistake or was that intentional? And then um, I'll let you two answer uh, about whether or not you found that sweet tip. Patrick, you want to go first? Yeah, so I can't say that I thought it was sweet tipped when I smoked it. That said, at least I'm certainly not in the, in the sense of explicitly sweet tipped cigars. But I do remember a very distinct sweetness that I thought may have been an interesting byproduct of the sherry barrels, maybe the Connecticut broadleaf, in the binder, or maybe the combination of the two. I think really that I've, I've had, I don't know if you have, but I've smoked the sherry tobacco by itself, mm. the sherry aged tobacco, and that's a very sort of like Ometepe and Olor. It's once you smoke it by itself and you, you realize what it tastes like, it's it's a, something you can identify whenever it generally uses it, which isn't a ton to be quite right. frank. Um, but whereas like the sweet tip, like I mean that's a sugar residue on the lips. I mean that's that's something that's yeah. I don't I don't remember having that sensation, but I do remember the flavor being distinct. Brooks? Well, see, the interesting thing for me was that, um, you know... It, it, you going right to answer this or are you going to lose the audience? Right before the, uh, the uh, top 25 and we're doing all of it, we're smoking cigars, you know, um, in a, at a pretty rapid pace in terms of, or at least I am, um, I had forgotten which cigar you talked about that you'd reviewed that, um, that had the sweet tip, you'd mentioned it, and uh, I picked it up, the, my sample of this cigar, and uh, there was no doubt in my mind that it was, I mean, it's very obvious. Um, I don't know if it was on purpose or not. I, I doubt seriously that it was, but uh, it's definitely obvious on, on the one that I smoked for sure. I'm very interested. We have three left, four left of them. Yeah. I'm very interested to see if, uh, if uh, any of those have the same. I mean, what's interesting about this is it was rolled by a single pair. So uh, that means somebody, one of two people got, or one person got, got sugar on their hands when they were rolling it. And it just seems like something that wouldn't, like, I, I would be very surprised if General says, oh, yeah, we meant to have half of them sweet-tipped and the other half of the box not sweet-tipped. But um, whatever the case is, the, the one thing is it, it didn't make anything worse. Um, and, um, you know, sugar is used in a lot of different products, including in, a lot of it in Diplomatico. Um, and it's, it's done because people like sugar. Um, and, and sweetness helps uh, to bring out flavors oftentimes. And, and I don't think that the sweet tip made it any worse. I, to be quite frank, I probably would have scored. I don't remember wh how I scored each individual cigar, but... You know, it got a 93, and, and what that means is the cigars were very good across the board. And to finish number two on this list, um, you know, after the other three of you smoked it, um, there's no question. It's a sweet tipped or not, it's going to be a good cigar. Yeah, I mean, at $90, you're really getting into a, a, a level of lavishness and luxury that um, I thought may be playing a bit of a role in what I was tasting even at some, at some points. Because you go, maybe there's just... There's something about this I'm not getting in other cigars. And that's, again, I did not walk away from that cigar going sweet-tipped, but definitely different than what I would get elsewhere. Um, and to be clear, the blend is excellent. Uh, you yeah. know, we talk about sweet tip a and lot. And also but not, not the same blend as the first release, which I think is worth pointing out. Mm -hmm. um, and I said this yesterday with packaging, and, and I'll repeat it anytime I mention the second release of Spectre. Uh, the first release was very good. The cigar was good. The packaging won our packaging in the years uh, awards. But there were a couple things that felt a little bit flimsy and whatnot. But it was so sort of revolutionary um, in terms of how they decided to display the cigars. We thought it was worthy of the packaging awards. Didn't make the top 25. This release, it seems like they figured out not only how to make uh, whatever sort of holes were in the packaging, but also the cigar is, is absolutely excellent. I'm curious to see what, what General does. And that's the, the third company on the list to, to put two cigars on the list. All right. Anything else before we move on? I think it's that time. All right. Well, here is our top 25 so far. Uh, I hope my dad's not watching. He might have a seizure, and I might have to take responsibility for it. But our number one cigar of the year is going to show up on the screen now. 
It is the Hoya de Nicaragua Intaño CT in the Robusto size. Uh, this is the second consecutive year that Hoya de Nicaragua has taken the top honors from us, which I will get to in a second. Uh, this is uh, going to be referred to as the Intaño Connecticut by everyone else, uh, but officially it's called the CT. Or uh, CT. Yeah, depending on if you know your Spanish is good enough to do that. And um, it's, uh, I believe, the least expensive cigar we've ever had win top cigar honors at this site. And it is, uh, we don't factor price into scores. This is simply just based off of what the performance is. And uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, there is, I mentioned this when I read up the Factory of the Year Award, which Hoya won. Um, there's no question when it comes to companies that are making new cigars over the last 18 months, two years, Hoya Nicaragua is on a completely different level than anyone else. Um, it is uh, astonishing to see the quality of cigars they're putting out, not just for themselves, but also for uh, the contract manufacturing that they do for people like uh, Steve Socket, Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust, as well as Omar um, at, um, at Fratello. And uh, it is uh, an absolutely fantastic cigar, uh, an easy cigar to smoke. And, um, you know, I, one of the things, and then I'll open up for the rest of you guys, um, you know, when I was reviewing it, it was like, well, is this more Antonio or more Connecticut? And, and the sort of conclusion is it's a little bit of both because that's the obvious way is let's not answer the question. But I, I really, you know, I wish they wouldn't have called it Antonio, Connecticut. I wish they would have just called it something else and let it stand on itself um, because it, it it doesn't really remind me of Antonio and it, 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 in many cases, and it also doesn't really remind me of Connecticut. It doesn't smoke like a Connecticut cigar. It's a medium full profile. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and, and then we can you know, have some more discussion about this cigar, is uh, you know, it's interesting to me that Hoy de Nicaragua has branded itself as we make strong cigars. We have Antonio, we have Antonio Double Corojo. Um, and then like in the last five years, they've said, well, you know what, we make strong cigars, but we can do other things too. So we're gonna do Antonio Grand Reserva, uh, the Numero Uno, which won last year, which is an, another Connecticut wrap cigar of all things. Uh, Cinco de Cadiz wasn't a particularly, it was a medium full cigar, but it wasn't you know, balls to the wall strength, which is something that they've actually used in marketing for Antonio. Um, and yet it seems like Hoya de Nicaragua, like A, they don't actually volume wise, most of their volume is not super strong cigars. Uh, they're not making the strongest cigars in the world. I would say Romacraft's making stronger cigars with Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal. Um, but also like Hoya de Nicaragua is making really good cigars in the medium plus to medium full portfolio in terms of strength um, and, and body and full flavor. And um, it's a fitting honor. And um, I don't know when we're gonna give them not this trophy, but one that looks very similar to it. Um, but it's it's very well deserved. And uh, if you haven't had the cigar yet, you should you should obviously go out and try it. Yeah, I I got stuck on two things about the cigar. One was the conversations we were having with uh, Juan Martinez and Mario Perez at the trade show about how this cigar had seemingly been. There's the imp- so much smoke going in your face. Thing, I, that's very true. Hopefully, it, makes, it doesn't make me look less, or makes me look. Oh, you give it to me. Less dead. Whatever you called it's, me yesterday. It's going to go all the way over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this was like the impossible cigar to make because it was a blending of Antonio and Connecticut. And I think there was like, this was called the White Man Can't Jump Project at one point. And Would have so, been a better name. Well, except for the trademark thing. Put Brooks' face on it. <laughs> but I really, can't jump. I mean, interesting project that I heard so many things like we. We don't know how to make this Very work. High. We've tried it. We've, we've done it. We've gone down this road. It didn't work. Now we're going to go down this road and it doesn't work. And then here we are six months after the trade show and it's number one. Like that to me is a real testament to Hoya. And again, like you say, you put Antonio and Sete on the same band or on the same cigar and you say, well, which one is it? And again, not to not answer the question, you just say, don't worry about that. Just smoke the cigar enjoy it, let it do what it's going to do, take you where it wants to take you, and you'll get the most enjoyment out of it. Just don't think about it trying to be a Connecticut version of an Antonio or an Antonio version of a Connecticut. And I mean, I'll tell you the next day that when you let that happen and you go clear mind, the journey is definitely worth it with this cigar. Yeah, I think Charlie nailed it. He, they should have named it something different, I think, because I think that it would have, uh, it be very easily can stand in its own. Um, th- both of these cigars that won the top, uh, the top honors, I'm smoking the uh, last year's Numero Uno right now. Uh, both of them, to me, have been some of the most balanced profiles I've smoked in a very, very long time. And to me, the balance is really the star of the show when it comes to both of them, although they're very different cigars. Obviously, the uh, Connecticut is, is much stronger. 
but the balance that these cigars have is, is really astounding to me. And just everything just seems to fall into place uh, for this one and for the uh, Uno, but for this one as well. Uh, it's very difficult, I imagine, to have something that is a stronger Connecticut that has that, um, that amazing uh, uh, confluence of flavors and balance and, 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 and pepper and everything that you have in, these, in, these, uh, in the profile that this has. Uh, I was really, really impressed with it. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, Hoy is making some of the best cigars uh, in the world, as far as I'm concerned at this point. Interesting, interesting note, although, Charlie, you said that they do have a little bit, very, very small. Um, uh, what they described as a small farm. I don't uh, know what farm. that actually <laughs> means. Uh, but Hoya does not own they own one. Farm they own one small this farm. One small farm. They don't own any farm, uh, tobacco farms at all, other than this one small farm. None. And so all of the tobacco they're using for these amazing releases, including Saka, including Omar's uh, Fratello brand, is, uh, is all purchased from somebody else that theoretically anybody can purchase. Uh, and um, it's, it's really a testament to what they're doing is that they're, they're nailing just about everything that, uh, that, I've, that I've had from them in the past uh, two years. No, they, they're on a, a fantastic run. You know, if we learned anything um, earlier this week, and, and it's been the case of uh, – the entire history sort of or the recent history of it you know with the college football playoffs it's it's easy to win one or it's it's not easy but it, it's a lot easier to win one it's very very difficult to win two um and uh this is the first time we've ever had anyone win back to back uh they're only the second company joining davidoff to win multiple uh, half wheel cigar of the year awards and um you know they they did it both by the skin of their teeth um but regardless you know uh, to put even just to say you, you had two of the top two cigars in consecutive years um, is is uh, an incredible accomplishment, and um, be curious to see what they do in 2020. And uh, I think with that, we're gonna take a look at the full list because we can do that now. Maybe. So there is the entire list in its full glory. Uh, the top 25 cigars of the year. For those curious, there was actually only 26 cigars eligible for the list. Uh, we had a conversation a few months ago when I realized that this was a possibility that we may actually not have 25 cigars that score 91 points or above that are eligible. And uh, we actually agreed at the time, and if this ever, I guess, comes up again, we will... Uh, We'll just publish, if we only have 24, we'll publish a top 24. Um, but uh, we had 26. Uh, the Alec Bradley um, Project 40 was the, uh, the lone cigar out, um, but score 91, and, and to score 91 at half wheel is, is a pretty tough thing to do in case that's not entirely apparent. Uh, but a fantastic list um, nonetheless. Uh, we will have it up on the website shortly. Um, before we go, we're going to go through a couple more slides. So um, as I've mentioned throughout, uh, there were only three companies that managed to place two cigars um, on the list. Uh, it was Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust, General Cigar Company, and CLE. Um, so congrats to those companies. Uh, it is a fantastic accomplishment. Um, if you're making two of the top 25 cigars um, in any given year, uh, that's saying something. And, um, you know, unlike, uh, I think, a lot of other lists, you know, with Half Wheel, we've sort of taken the approach of we're going to put the 25 best cigars that meet these qualifications. We're not going to filter anything out. Um, and so uh, we've had some years, uh, there was one year a few years ago where Ty White placed five cigars on the list. Um, but uh, this year we had more companies than ever before. Um, and uh, we also had a handful of factories that placed two cigars on the list. Um, and so uh, very familiar names, obviously, El Aladino, General Cigar, Dominicana, Hoya, and then um, the other four, my father, Naxa, Placencia, and Topsa also managed to get two cigars on our list, uh, which is, uh, you know, an accomplishment in and of itself. And for those of you curious, uh, haven't done the math at home, uh, the country breakdown and goes like this. Uh, there were six cigars from the Dominican Republic, five cigars from Honduras, and 14 from Nicaragua. Uh, there was none from Cuba, America, or anywhere else. Um, there were a couple Cuban cigars that got very close to being eligible, but didn't ultimately make it. Um, I'm sure that we'll probably breach the sort of, you know, why doesn't more Cuban cigars show up in your list? We had two last year, um, but uh, there certainly are some, some tough things uh, that cause that. So with that all said, uh, if you have any questions, uh, leave them either in the comment section below. Brian Burt's going to pull the last ones out before we uh, end this video, and we will uh, get those comments questions sent to us and then we're going to address them uh, on Facebook Live. I'm sure we'll talk about some other things. Hopefully we order some food because uh, Liga Vrata 10 and rum is not the best way to start your day off, particularly if you only slept four hours last night. But uh, this has been our top 25. Um, as always at Half Wheel, uh, you know, we, uh, when, when Brooks and I sat down many years ago in Las Vegas at, many years at the trade show, um, he had the same amount of hair and, and I actually had less hair. Um, 
we, uh, you know, we sort of talked about what Half Wheel, we didn't have a name at the time, but what we wanted to do, and that was create the cigar website that we would want to read. And, um, you know, we, uh, we try to do that every day of the week. And, you know, that extends to every individual thing we do, whether it's the news stories that we would want to read, whether it's the legislation content, even the Bismarck, North Dakota parts of it that we would want to read, the editorials we want to read, and certainly the top 25 list that we would want to see. Um, every year, it kind of surprises me, and I, I, I can't imagine I'm alone in sort of what ends up on the top 25 list. It's certainly not the my favorite 25 cigars of the list. It's not Patrick's 25 favorite cigars of the year. Uh, you know, not Brooks's favorite 25 cigars of the year. Uh, but uh, if you make the list, you put out a really good cigar. And, um, you know, uh, congratulations to all of the companies that did that. And um, we'll be back in a bit. And one last plug. Uh, we do one last list, uh, which is the consensus. It is not our list. It is curated by Afwheel. Um, so what I have done since... Cur curated by you. Yeah, well, you pop out a little bit here and there, and Patrick was doing some work for me uh, yesterday on the consensus. But what we do is we take all the top 25 lists, top 10 lists, uh, whatever. There's some top seven lists for reasons that are beyond me. But uh, lists that are published by magazines, blogs, podcasters, YouTubers, et cetera, all the lists that I can find. There's a couple qualifications, um, and I put them into a spreadsheet, and then we try to, uh, there's a, a basic formula about trying to figure out, you know, kind of what all of the best of lists say are the best cigars of the year. That will be unveiled on Monday. I will be back here. Uh, Brooks and Patrick won't be, um, but uh, I'll be back here in front of the camera smoking a cigar and unveiling the consensus. So tune in at noon central time, one Eastern, and what do we determine that was 7 p.m. in the Netherlands? I believe, yes, I believe so. Seven or eight o'clock in in, in Western Europe. Uh, so uh, you can tune back in, and uh, as we've mentioned a couple times, uh, we're going to end this, and we will be back shortly. Any last words, Brooks? No. Toodles.